Hello, and welcome to EDHREX Upping the Average, where we take a commander's average deck list as compiled by the data on EDHREX and make some swaps to it to help take it from a good start to a great one. I hope you're prepared for this video because things could get grisly. A Eula Queen Among Bears is a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two bear with amazing art and amazing abilities. Each bear we play gives us either more plus one counters or lets us fight once our cubs are strong enough. A Eula flips back and forth between being the third and fourth most popular mono green commander in EDH, currently hovering at around 1400 decks. Her page is full of exactly what we'd expect to see. Tons of bears, especially 2-mana two 2-2s. Two but with some interesting options from old sets and a few token makers. How much can we really improve on a deck like this? Well, let's find out. Let's take a Eula's average deck list from the average deck feature and import it to the Architect deck building website. As always, any swaps we make to the list must either keep the total price cost neutral or else help lower the overall cost of the deck. All right, bear with me, cause this list is awesome. Look how many cool bears there are. If this is the place you're starting from, these majestic beasts will serve you very well. From Strixhaven professors to Ice Age polar bears, the bear creature type has never gotten explicit tribal support in a major standard set, but it has enough incidental representation across tons of magic sets over time that it's basically built up a pretty interesting roster. Plus, a lot of these classic mono green support pieces are absolutely sick. With all the stuff we've got going on here, we should be able to make short work of our foes, and we can do it all with our bare hands. Let's first get to know our core cards a little bit better. Obviously, we have a ton of bears. Mostly, they're two mana tutus without abilities, although the odd exception to this rule does crop up on occasion, either providing us with a funny keyword, mana production, or extra tokens. Ruxa from Strixhaven is a particularly delightful addition since he's stockier than most of our other friends, but we admittedly don't have tons of pure vanilla creatures for him to teach. It's important to note that this deck also gets a pretty substantial bout of help from bear imitators like Adaptive Automaton. Unlike other tribes that have tons of lords to pump up the whole team, bears are a bit more scant in that department. This is what also makes us very grateful to have good changelings for the deck, especially ones like Realmwalker, which can churn through extra cards, an ability that's very effective for a tribe with so many low mana value creatures. Sometimes casting the creatures isn't enough though, so Ayula's very grateful to find some cards that make bear tokens. Grizzly Fate in particular is possibly one of the best cards in the deck and the best named cards in the entire game. However, the thing I like most about this deck are the subtle tricks that work with Ayula herself. That ability to pump up either herself or her other bear friends gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of plus one counter synergy to play around with, including with classics like Harden Scales. It's an ETB ability too, which makes Panharmonicon even more awesome. Oh, and who could possibly forget the classic Bear Umbra for this bear deck? Speaking of pump, a sleeper hit in this deck is Ronus's Monument. Not only does it help us cast a chain of creatures more easily, it also gives our queen Trample, which helps us push through extra damage and makes it way more viable to defeat our enemies with commander damage from our two mana creature. A two mana commander can be pretty fierce early game, and this gives it a nice final push. Finally, we have to address the card advantage in this deck. Casting tons of small creatures means we need good card flow. Even though it's not a bear, Beast Whisperer is clutch here. Without enough card advantage, our tiny creatures won't be able to make it through a lengthy game of EDH. Luckily, Ayula can amp up some of the better draw spells out there, like Rishkar's, since she buffs herself up so much. Return of the Wild Speaker is really great too, but be careful on this one. It doesn't work at all on Changelings, because those are also technically humans, and Return doesn't do anything for human creatures. The buff still works on enough of the army though, and that card advantage from just Ayula's power alone is often pretty darn huge. There's one more thing I have to address before we can even get started, and that's the makeup of lands in this deck. As we can see, there's a high number of forests and also a single snow-covered forest. The reason for this is actually a teensy bit tough to explain. Most commander decks contain only regular basics, because that's, you know, pretty darn normal. But some commander decks out there use 100% snow basics, and some decks even contain a mix of both for the purposes of cards like Field of the Dead. And this really isn't uniform for any single commander, because even for a single commander, some players will opt for regular basics and some players out there might opt for snow basics in that deck instead. This means the average deck data is filled with a bunch of case-by-case -case scenarios, which is tough for a single algorithm to parse. The reason this is important for an Eula deck is because of this card we see in the 99, Spirit of the Alder Guard, which fetches snow lands and gets bigger for each one of them that we have. On rate, this might actually be one of the best bears in the entire deck. 
However, it does force a Eula decks to basically always use snow basics, instead of getting to personalize their mana base with their favorite forest art. In my games with this deck, I've asked to rule zero my regular basic lands as snow basics, and that's generally been fine, but it's also generally been kind of awkward, because some players don't understand why you wouldn't just go get snow basics. The reason, of course, is that when the deck is all snow basics, the average cost goes from this to this. Yeah. In other words, this is all kind of messy, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to assume that a deck that contains Spirit of the Alder Guard is supposed to contain 100% Snow Basics. So before we officially start, I'm going to edit the average deck list to reflect that and change all of the regular forests to Snow Covered Forests. I'll leave it to you, the viewer, to determine the route that's best for you and your playgroup here. And if any other snow related cards come up during this video, I'll provide alternative options for them for anyone who's not using snow lands. Woof. Or perhaps Growl. That was a lot, but we're honestly just getting started. Let's see where we can make some improvements. I've got three rough categories I want to use to tackle this list. The bear necessities, some hibernation, and of course, a nice big bear hug. Let's start off with section one. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but not all of the bears we're currently using are the very best that we could actually play. We're basically just going to make a bunch of tiny tweaks here, because a lot of little changes can add up to a big change. So I like a lot of these. Almost every bear present here should be. With a tribe like this, there's not a ton of Ursa Major improvements to make. Still, there are little edges we can hone and sand off, and I'd like to do that with this here Woodland Changeling. There's nothing wrong with this one at all. It's a 2-mana two 2-2 two -two that's got all of the creature types, including bear. Perfectly fine. I am going to opt to swap it, though, for a lesser-known Guardian Gladewalker. Also a changeling, so also bear. Also 2-mana, but it has, like, 10% more flexibility. We can put that counter onto itself, or maybe if we want, we can put it onto a Eula. Maybe we'll have hardened scales in play, and we'll get two counters instead of just one. This isn't a mind-blowing change at all, but that extra counter could perhaps one day be the difference between 20 commander damage and 21 commander damage, and when that day comes, we'll be grateful for this change. The next swap I'm going to make is another straight across swap for a strictly better bear buddy. Golden Bear is fine. 4 mana 4-3 is cute, but not breaking any records. I'm going to recommend exchanging it for Professor of Zoomancy. One more toughness, and it makes one more body, a little pest token. Again, this is like the minorest of possible changes, but I like having extra chump blockers. Oddly enough, we do actually have to weigh the cost of this swap against the fact that in the 99, we have Ruxa, and Ruxa likes vanilla creatures like the Golden Bear. I guess there must be like a rivalry between the Strixhaven General Studies and the Zoomancy departments. I don't know, I like the extra chump blocker. Plus, when I cast like an overwhelming stampede, I really appreciate having one more body around to benefit from that, and those scenarios feel a lot more relevant to me, so I'm gonna side on Team Zoomancy here. I guess I must just be a teacher's pet. Finally, don't be alarmed, but there is an imposter in our midst. Stuffed bear is not a real bear. It can only become a bear. In all seriousness, though, I actually really don't like this card for this deck. Ayula wants bears to enter the battlefield so that she can get counters and get fighting. This artificial wannabe is just too creepy, and that makes it literally unbearable. Oh, and in case your deck isn't doing snow stuff and you're not running that Spirit of the Alder Guard, my proposed swap out here will be the Changeling Bloodline Protector. Regular old bear pretender, but it gets a little bigger as we get more bears, and that makes it pretty funny. I don't want to add too many changelings to the deck because of that Return of the Wild Speaker thing I mentioned earlier, but this one is pretty darn funny. That's actually all I've got for section one. Like I said, I really love a lot of the bears that have made it into this average deck. It's a good mix of cheap creatures that Ayula can chain through very quickly, and a few slightly more expensive bears that have small but interesting abilities. So let's turn our attention now to one of the most difficult times of the year. Let's talk about hibernation. There's nothing better than a nice long nap. For this section, we're going to take a look at the ways that we can encourage our opponent's creatures to basically disappear, and how we can also improve our own cozy comforts. I know, kind of weird to talk about those two things in one section. They do seem like they're polar opposites. Before I really begin, I actually want to start by sprucing up our removal. A Eula can fight things, but that won't solve 100% of our problems. We might need other ways to neuter enemy creatures. There are two mono green creature enchantments that I'd love to get in here to handle pesky enemies, and they're happily very budget friendly. Lignify and Kenrith's transformation can turn any Avacyn into a helpless tree, or Okoify even the grandest of dragons. Kenrith's transformation even replaces itself, which is completely ludicrous. Removal effects in green typically rely upon fighting in some form or fashion, so it's nice to use these to diversify our options a little bit and help us get out of tricky spots more easily. 
All right, this next part is gonna contain some tough love. There are some token makers in this deck that I think look very good, but in actuality are not as helpful as they would appear. Up first, I don't like Caller of the Claw in this deck. I don't like it at all, for the same reason that Azuri Claw of Progress decks learned to move away from it too, even though Caller of the Claw, bewilderingly, was in Azuri's original precon. The best benefit from this card basically only happens after a board wipe, which means our commander will not be in play to see any of the tokens that Caller of the Claw creates. I suppose there's also a convoluted scenario where we attack with some creatures, lose some bears in combat, and then cast the Caller of the Claw afterwards and create tokens then. But even to make that scenario happen, it requires us to make bad attacks. I just, I can't be bothered. This card makes tokens at the wrong time. So yeah, I'm gonna cut this because I'd rather spend our card slots on things that prevent our board from being destroyed in the first place. More on that in a bit. As if that wasn't enough, my next chop is Kamal's Summons. This card is just too risky. It's really cute that it makes bear tokens, but the symmetrical nature of this card makes it a grade A trap card. While there are occasionally spell-heavy decks that our opponents will play that won't get any benefit from this card at all, the reality is that there are also a lot of creature-heavy decks out there that will get benefit, sometimes even more benefit from it than we would receive. We're giving enemies blockers by casting this spell. Ayula can fight the tokens with her ETB ability, for sure, but even in that case, we'd be missing out on the thing that we really want to do after we get an influx of bears, which is to use her ability to super pump our board. Plus, even if our commander can take advantage of bear tokens entering the battlefield, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're breaking parity on this symmetrical effect, because other decks can use the extra bodies in crazy ways too. Giving extra sacrifice fodder to an aristocrat's deck, for example, is a very dangerous thing. And some decks will end up with way more cards in hand than we could ever hope to get, which makes this card kind of uncastable if our opponent has like 15 cards in hand. Plus, if an opponent has a Cathar's Crusade or like a Doubling Season in play, which are extremely popular cards, then yeah, this is not a spell that we can risk casting. A lot of the finesse with this card comes down to finding the right window to cast it, but that is ultimately my issue with it. The optimal timing window is just too slim. It's also one of the worst cards we could ever top deck too, and the late game is already a pretty weak point for this deck that we need to work to improve. So sorry Kamal Summons, I like the idea of you, but every time I drew you during gameplay, you turned out to be very insidiously mediocre. I can't deny that you've got great art though. Okay, we're not done with the bad token makers yet. Next is Words of Wilding. I kinda had a Mugatu feels like I'm taking crazy pills moment every time I saw this thing in my hand. I mean, it sounds nice in theory, I think. If we're hard up for bears, especially in the late game, then this can ensure we always get one. But, um, yeah, no. Magic players will famously tell you that the most powerful words in the entire game are draw a card. And this takes that away. Like, there are some decks out there that can use this cycle of Words of X draw replacement enchantments to amazing effect, but I don't think this is one of those decks. I think it sounds nice in theory to use some cool draw effect and get bonus bears instead of overloading our hand, but having that much extra mana to make all those bears is unrealistic, nigh impossible sometimes. And even if we did have enough mana to make extra bears, I still think I'd rather draw a bunch of cards instead anyway, because even if we draw a bunch of lands, for example, those are good to discard to hand size to enable threshold on Grizzly Fate, or to find more lands for Aula's influence or to put fodder into the graveyard for bearscape, or to find a mass pump spell, or even to find another cool draw spell. If we're stuck top decking late game, I feel like this is the very last card in our deck that we want to see, because it just mocks us. What we really need to focus on in this deck is shoring up our card advantage, because if we draw enough cards, we'll find a bunch of actual bears, plus a bunch of other awesome spells that make them cheap to cast and deadly to behold. So goodbye Words of Wilding, because dang it, I want to draw cards. Moving away from those skeptical token makers, I've got one other thing I want to do before winter hits. I want to take a look at the landscape to make sure we've got a good cave to hibernate in, so I'm going to make a brief stop at this here Rampant Growth. This is a perfectly good card, but I'm actually going to make a quick change on this one because of the way this specific deck works. The first change I considered was exchanging it for a Sakura Tribe Elder instead, because that could occasionally help us trigger Beast Whisperer and other types of those effects. But Sakura Tribe Elder's not a bear, and in any case, I actually decided on a different card, because of the way this deck's tempo plays out. 
Our commander's a two drop. Ayula is basically always our turn two play, so I'd like our mana acceleration to fit with that a little more smoothly. What I'm gonna do is exchange the rampant growth in the average deck for a card that should be in more mono green decks, period. Nissa's Pilgrimage. It's basically Kodama's Reach and Cultivate, but only for forests. It even has a chance to do more than the other two sometimes. This is a better card for mono green decks, yet it's routinely overlooked. Cultivate shows up in 60% of Eula decks, but Nissa's Pilgrimage only shows up in 22%. That doesn't seem right. A turn 2 Eula followed by a turn 3 ramp spell that also sets us up for bigger beasts on the next turn feels really good. After that quick ramp switch, it's time to scout the lands we'll be frolicking in. I do think there's still room for more improvement here. Exchanging a few basics for some cool non-basic utility lands can provide us with some extra value for free. I see a cycling land in the deck already, and I think it's a decent idea to add Slippery Karst to join it. Again, we want to mitigate against bad top decking scenarios in the late game. Turns out there's actually another cycling land that I want to add in here too, because it's got a secret twist to it. The Green Desert is basically just another Slippery Karst, which is nice, but unremarkable. However, it pairs with another land that I also think this deck could use, Scavenger Grounds, one of the best Grave Hate cards in the entire format, and free Grave Hate seems pretty dang good so that our bears can make sure those pesky graveyard players are staying honest. Normally, we're used to Scavenger Grounds just sacrificing itself to activate that ability, but it can actually sacrifice any desert, including the Grain Cycling Land. I've personally been completely blown out by this interaction several times. One Scavenger Grounds activation my Marin deck can probably recover from, but two? There's no way. Cool tech for a mono green deck. There are two more utility lands I'm going to throw in here as well. The first is a pretty standard Myriad Landscape. I like these a lot in monocolor decks. Occasional ramp if the mana is free, or if we need something more substantial to do on our third turn. The other one I'd like to add is a lot more impressive though, and that's Bonder's Enclave. Ayula hits 4 power pretty easily, and some of our other bears here are 4 power naturally. I really like this ability to get some extra incidental draw right there in our mana base, and this card is also pretty cheap for such a neat effect. Speaking of draw though, we're not quite done. Let's turn our attention to the most important part of the deck in our third and final section. We gotta talk about card draw here, because a bear hug is all about having your hands full of joy. I was looking for another bear pun to put here, but I decided against it, by the way. I don't know, anything I could think of to say was just totally ursinine. The biggest problem this deck faces is running out of steam. Ayula can have a very impressive early game, since she comes down so fast and usually gets to 6 or 8 power pretty handily. However, with just a ton of tutus filling up the 99, longevity is a real issue and we need more card advantage to fix that problem and maintain our ability to sustain ourselves throughout an extended game. Therefore, the first card I'm going to recommend is a tasteful greater good. Sacrifice a creature, draw a bunch, pitch away the three cards we don't need, and it's all at instant speed. I think this might look dubious to folks at first glance. Discarding cards totally blows, and this isn't an aristocrat's deck, so what gives with the sacrifice outlet, right? Thing is, Ayula's pretty consistently gonna get up to 6, 8, 10 power. She may even pump up other bears, but because of commander damage and a desire to make her fight effect as big as possible, she is usually the best target for all of her counters. That's why this deck doesn't include shroud enablers after all. When our commander gets that big, it comes under fire a lot. So an instant speed zero mana ability that lets us cash in for a quick burst of cards means we are immediately set up to get rebuilding again on the very next turn. Is Ayula about to die? Okay, we'll draw 10 and toss away three random lands from among them. And we can repeat that again in the future whenever we need for free. That's saucy. I also have to confess something here. I don't think Vivian is the best Planeswalker for this deck. Like, okay, the flash ability is really cool since it gives us instant speed Ayula triggers, but Viv is pretty darn vulnerable, even with that plus one effect, especially because we don't always want to use her plus one effect. We also want to be able to use her minus two effect to get some card selection. The thing is, the card selection is nice, but I really think it's a better idea to lean into those Rishkar style draw effects, because our commander gets huge, and I think Ayula prefers accuracy by volume over accuracy by selection. I tried swapping Viv for Garrick, and I was just really impressed. Five mana to draw usually like four to six cards, but sometimes it draws 12? Even if Garrick only lasts for one activation, that is a really impressive bout of card draw. And while it's possible that Ayula might get removed in response to this ability, it's pretty common for us to still have at least one other four power creature in play to make sure that this card's never a complete whiff. 
I just feel like this is a pretty cool card in a deck where the commander is constantly putting tons of plus one counters everywhere. Speaking of counters, my final addition is my absolute favorite card ever for Ayula, Cauldron of Souls. Tap to give things persist, so if they die, they come back with a minus one minus one counter. This might seem innocuous at first, but with Ayula's ability, this is downright amazing. If our bear army dies, they'll come back with minus one counters, and then Ayula's ability will trigger. We can put two counters on all of our creatures, and then when a minus one counter and a plus one counter meet, they annihilate each other, which means we can use the Cauldron of Souls all over again and constantly save our board from removal effects. It's completely barbaric. All right, let's finish up with some honorable mentions. If you're playing this deck on a budget, what are some possible alternatives to the expensive cards in the list? Well, first things first, a Nykthos is bonkers expensive, and it's perfectly fine to use just a normal basic land instead of that. Aside from that, here are three notably expensive cards in the deck. Heroic Intervention just saw a reprint in AFR, but it's still like 10 bucks. If you don't want to drop 10 on that card, might I recommend instead Wrap in Vigor. There are a couple of board wipes that do prevent regeneration, but most of them don't, and this is a nice, cheap way to rescue our Ursine buddies. Up next is Bear Umbra, which is perfectly on theme, but costs a pretty penny. I'm gonna make a weird recommendation here. I think Teamer Sabretooth might be worth a look. It rescues bears from danger, but more importantly, it gives us the ability to cast them multiple times. This can repeatedly trigger our commander or our draw engines, and it's all around just a pretty solid piece of work. Oh, and if you're going for the Bear Force 1 memes as inspired by Loading Ready Run, you can of course make the budget swap instead for Four Bears Blade, which is of course, Four Bears. Can't forget to mention that. Finally, the Great Henge is just absolutely monstrously expensive. I mean, it's an amazing card, but it's a big price tag. If you happen to be playing with Snowlands, but don't have $50 henges, I think Blessing of Frost isn't too bad to look into here. We've got some synergies that care about plus one counters in the deck already, like the Hardened Scales and the Cauldron of Souls, so that's a pretty nice tie-in right there, but dispersing the counters also usually means that we have at least three creatures to draw cards off of. Seems like a nice budget draw spell that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. If you're not using Snowlands, or if you are but you still want even more draw, which honestly makes sense, I'm also going to suggest Viridian Revel here. I, I very nearly made this an official inclusion, but I'll admit I am still testing it. The thing is, artifact tokens are all over the place in EDH right now, especially treasure tokens, which are prevalent in, I feel, nearly every single game. Sometimes this enchantment maybe doesn't feel like it does anything, but other times when players have been making treasures and clues and food left, right, and center, this is a draw engine that just does all the things. I suspect I'll be using this card way more often in EDH games, as we see more and more clue, food, and treasure making cards with every new set. Give this one a shot. I'd love to hear from you if you think this card is good enough that it belongs in the main deck proper, and not just as a budget recommendation. What about the inverse? What if you're spicing the deck up even more lavishly? Well, in that case, I suspect you'll probably avoid some of the draw options I recommended earlier, and instead opt for the likes of Sylvan Library. I also think it'll be worthwhile to check out some bear-tastic lands. Mutavault and Faceless Haven are surprise bears right there in the mana base. I'm tempted too to suggest looking into the card Vigor. Maybe the mana cost on this one is a bit high for this deck, which does tend to be a little bit low to the ground, but I don't know, this looks pretty dang great in a deck whose commander goes around procking fight triggers all the time. Play a bear, fight some random 8-8 and get a bunch of counters? Sounds pretty great. Oh, and speaking of counters, really flashy Ayula decks could lean into those even more. The Ozolith will make sure that any counters Ayula accumulated are never far away for long. Such an amazing card, this. And finally, branching evolution from the Jumpstart set is a thing of absolute beauty. When we're able to put twice as many counters onto our creatures, it's pandemonium. Alright, I think that should do it. You can find a link to the list in the description below with the cuts in the maybe board. I hope you've enjoyed your time with Ayula, and remember, anything is possible. If you've got any other recommendations you'd like to share with your fellow Cub Scouts, make sure you leave your suggestions in the comments below. And as always, thanks so much for watching.